Stories Jay and I look at on this episode of This Week in FCPA, the NBA Playoffs Are Here edition, include Mike Volkoff takes a deep dive into recent DOJ trial record, a sexual harassment case too implausible for Hollywood, the KT FCPA enforcement action analysis, the Stericycle FCPA settlement, How Data Analytics Informs a Recent SEC Enforcement Action, SEC Chairman Gary Gensler Reflects on One Year of His Chairmanship, Into the Crystal Ball on Climate Disclosures, Should Elon Musk Have Been Stopped Long Time Ago, What Should Be on Your Audit Committee Agenda for 2022, and Putting the G First in ESG, Podcast, Compliance Week 2022, and more all on This Week in FCPA. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance. Welcome back to This Week in FCPA, episode 298 for the week ending, April 22, 2022. The NBA playoffs are here. As Jay's beloved Celtics won game one with a buzzer beater and dismantled Brooklyn last night to go up 2-0, We are back to look at some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories in this edition. Jay, how are you feeling about your Celts? Uh, I'm feeling good. I'm going to get on that bandwagon and ride it for at least this series and see how we do after Brooklyn, but I don't want to look too far ahead. What are the the Rockets up to, Tom? Uh, They are uh, getting ready to pick first or second in the uh, NBA draft. Nice. So what is our first story to kick things off, Tom? So, Jay, we have a uh, actually a trilogy of blog posts. Note the use of the big word, trilogy, from Mike, uh, Mike Volkoff. And Mike's a formal federal, former federal prosecutor. So when he talks about federal prosecutions, you need to listen. And he really takes a look at some of the uh, successes and uh, setbacks the DOJ has recently had in criminal prosecutions. Um, most of us are thinking about the Roger Ung trial because the DOJ had a huge win there. Uh, he um, talked about that in the context of something I raised in my commentary on that trial, which was the Gunstein cases, which were uniformly tossed uh, by uh, the federal district court after mistrials in front of two different sets of juries. He also talked about the... Um, Elizabeth Holmes, Theranos success uh, as well. Uh, But Mike took a a kind of a a much broader view going back to the financial crisis of 08, which he said was the absolute nadir of the Department of Justice, which he characterized in a line we're well known to us, Monty Python, run away. And um, there was a lot of criticism rightly leveled at the DOJ for its failures to take on the financial industry who put the country literally in recession with their financial engineering antics. Uh, But uh, he brings that forward and uh, talks about the trials that I mentioned, also a, a massive failure in the Boeing case where they tried to pin the entire 737 MAX disaster literally on one Boeing employee when it was a complete failure of uh, culture, failure of institution, failure of corporate governance, failure at the board of directors le- level, f- failure at the CEO level. And in an interesting, almost throwaway line, he said, that's what happens when you outsource your investigations to big law firms. Um, they don't go after the institutional players. Um, they'll, they're not there to do that. So, um, Lots of insights into these three. Frankly, Jay, I don't typically see or hear Mike criticize the DOJ very much, but uh, he leveled some some pretty direct uh, criticisms, and I hope uh, that those who are reading him and listening him in the DOJ will take those critiques as uh, really from the heart of a former federal prosecutor who uh, believes the DOJ, at least as currently constituted, perhaps not under Trump, his beloved institution and literally America's law firm and uh, 
they will take uh, into account some of their successes, what were the reasons, and some of their failures and lessons learned there. But it's a really interesting three-part series, and I would commend it to every compliance professional uh, to take a look at it. Uh, Jay, we've tried to have a segment on this show where I describe a fact pattern for you, and you tell me whether it is plausible for a Hollywood script. I'm not even going to try to describe this next fact pattern. Uh, because when I described it to my wife, even she didn't believe it. So uh, is there a sexual harassment case that is too implausible for Hollywood? And if so, what is it? I think it's this one right here. Uh, just a, a warning to everyone. We're a family-friendly show. But for the next couple minutes, I would suggest some uh, earmuffs if there are youngins in around. A female boss at a top DC consulting firm tried to perform oral sex on an unwilling male colleague in front of both her twin sister and the man's girlfriend, the lawsuit claims. Kyle Reinhardt, 53, is suing his former boss, Kim Serka, 47, over what he claims was an instance of sexual assault in 2017 and multiple other incidents. The U.S. Air Force veteran said he was fired from his $325,000 a year job at a consulting firm called Guidehouse last year, despite stellar performance reviews for refusing his boss's advantage. My, Reinhardt helped the firm secure a $110 million contact with, contract with the Department of Veteran Affairs, but he says that all the while he endured a free willing drinking and sexual culture that was most evident during the all but required after hour schmoozing. Reinhardt, a retired Air Force officer, studied architecture at Yale and health and urban planning at Harvard. He was a senior policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs and joined PricewaterhouseCoopers, which later spun off its public sector unit as Guidehouse in 2012. He began reporting to Circa, a partner at the firm in 2015. Reinhardt is now suing his former boss and the company for unspecified damages, alleging discrimination, retaliation, battery, emotional distress, and a violation of wage payment laws. He says Guidehouse denied him three months severance that was specified in his contract, but is still enforcing the provision that prevents him from doing consulting work with the VA for two years. Across 31 sorted pages, Reinhardt details multiple instances in which Circa and others made him feel uncomfortable during late night dinners and parties that he saw as necessary if he wanted to advance. Whenever he brought up his concerns, Reinhardt said he was told to play the game and keep everything in the family. Circa, of course, is denying all allegations. In a statement to the Daily Mail, her attorney, Charles Molster, called Reinhardt a disgruntled disgruntled former employee who was terminated for performance issues and is now attempting to wage a smear campaign. Reinhardt said things changed in 2017 when he was passed over for a promotion and sent on increasingly cumbersome assignments outside of D.C. while being put up in, here's the tough part, cheap motels, including one with bloodstains ick on the furniture. He was placed on a pretextual performance improvement plan and was fired this past September in 2021. Reinhardt was not promoted to Guidehouse partner because he repeatedly refused to accede to Circa's advances and refused to participate in an improper sexual culture encouraged by Circa and fostered by the firm, the lawsuit states. He said Guidehouse denied him three months severance that was promised to him when he first joined and the company, however, is still enforcing a provision that prevents him from consulting with past clients. He submitted a complaint with the D.C. Office of Human Rights for Discrimination Based on Sex, Retaliation, and Status, and as a victim of sexual offense a month later, but he withdrew it in February. Reinhardt's attorney, Sam Buffon, says he's never come across a case like this. I have not encountered a work environment quite like this one, the attorney said. The world of government contracting can often have colorful workplaces, but what we see in the actions here are really way beyond the pale. Guidehouse and Circus attorney did not immediately respond to requests for comments for DailyMail.com. 
So that's one I'd never thought we'd be having here. Tom, what is your analysis of KT Corp's FCPA enforcement action? So Jay, it's actually not my analysis. It's the analysis of lawyers from uh, Debo Boys in uh, uh, um, Plimpton. Boys. Plimpton, yes. Kara Brockmeyer, Andrew Levin, Carlos Seeger, and Constantine Berlico uh, wrote a article in uh, Compliance Enforcement, New York University's uh, great blog. And we've discussed the KT enforcement action on this podcast, Jay, but they had some interesting insights that we really hadn't focused on. And uh, they said as a key takeaway uh, that the SEC – is looking more closely at charitable contributions, um, particularly uh, additionally gift cards uh, that can be easily converted into slush funds. So, Jay, I think over our compliance careers, we viewed sort of gifts, travel, and entertainment as relatively low-hanging fruit, both in terms of things that uh, you can look at and, and remediate pretty quickly. Uh, it's easy, low-hanging fruit for uh, the regulators too. And then a little bit above that is charitable contributions. So uh, I really appreciated their, the Debo Voice lawyers re-raising the issue of charitable contributions in the context of KT enforcement action. And what I would ask our listeners to consider, Jay, is that if uh, give you a chance to go look at your program, are there any uh, areas of weakness or red flags or even anomalies in your charitable contribution program uh, we've certainly seen those types of enforcement actions over the years. And uh, Kara, Andrew, and company remind us uh, that you need to, to pressure test your internal charitable donations programs to make sure that uh, you don't have any uh, uh, anti-bribery, anti-corruption uh, considerations in it going forward. So a good review. As I said, Jay, uh, we have talked about this case. So I didn't want to really review the, the background facts of it because we've uh, visited at it at some length. Uh, when it was released earlier this year, but um, good piece from uh, our friends over at Debo Voice. Um, but we did have, Jay, a major FCPA announcement, indeed yesterday, I believe, and um, the Stericycle FCPA enforcement action. Uh, I have to throw my hat up to Harry Casson, continuing his father's great tradition of breaking all FCPA enforcement actions first. So from the FCPA blog, we got a great... Uh, a summary from Harry Casson. And what did you see in this case that uh, intrigued you, interested you or other, Jay? Thanks, Tom. And I'm also going to take a little bit from the DOJ's uh, Wednesday press release that says Stericycle agrees to pay over $84 million in a coordinated foreign bribery resolution. Stericycle, which is an international waste management company headquartered in Lake Forest, Illinois, has agreed to pay more than $84 million to resolve parallel investigations by authorities in the US, Brazil, and Mexico, as well as Argentina. According to the court documents, Stericycle entered into a three-year deferred prosecution agreement with DOJ in connection with the filing of a criminal information charging the company with two counts of conspiracy to violate the anti-bribery provision of the FCPA and the FCPA's books and records provision. Pursuant to the DPA, Stericycle's criminal penalty is $52.5 million. The department has agreed to credit up to one-third of the penalty and fines to authorities in Brazil and related proceedings, including an amount of $9.3 million for investigations in Brazil. In addition, Stericycle has agreed to pay approximately $2.8, rather $28 million to resolve a parallel investigation by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Stericycle accepted responsibility for its corrupt business practices in paying millions of dollars in bribes to foreign officials in multiple companies, rather countries, said Assistant Attorney General Kenneth Polite of the Justice Department. The company also maintained false books and records to, corrupt, to conceal corrupt and improper payments made by subsidiaries in Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. Today's resolution with Stericycle shows that the FBI and international law enforcement partners will not allow corruption to permeate domestic or international markets. The consequences of violating the FCPA are clear. Companies that bribe foreign officials for business advantage will be held accountable. 
According to the company's admissions and court documents, Stereocycle conspired to corruptly offer and pay approximately 10.5 million in bribes to foreign officials in Brazil, Mexico, and, or and Argentina in order to obtain and retain business and other advantages for the company. Specifically, between 2011 and 2016, Stericycle caused hundreds of bribe payments to be made to official government agencies in Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina to obtain and retain business. Under the DPA, Stericycle agreed to continue to enhance its compliance program and maintain an independent compliance monitor for two years, followed by self-reporting for the department to the department for the remainder of the term. Uh, there's a lot I didn't go into, code names for bribes and what they're doing, but uh, these are the kind of matters where we usually see that, uh, you know, gifts and en entertainment, uh, bribes, and, you know, this has been going on. This uh, investigation started back in 2011, so uh, it's nice to see uh, one of the more meteor cases come up. We're only in April, so hopefully this means that the uh, floodgates could open up soon. Tom? What is our colleague Jacqueline Jager writing about in this week's issue of Compliance Week? Well, Jay, uh, before we leave Stericycle, I think that the greatest or biggest takeaway, certainly for uh, Mrs. this week at FCPA, was that uh, cookies are now code words for bribes. Previously, <laughs> we had chocolates, but now we have cookies. So uh, really uh, kind of set her back a, a notch for uh, host dinner evening cookies. Uh, because now she has to associate that with uh, illegal FCPA conduct. Luckily, there's also ice cream in the Fox household, so maybe she can turn her uh, vision that way. Mrs. Compliance Evangelist. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, Jay Jacklin wrote a really interesting article about an SEC enforcement action uh, where the SEC used data analytics to... Um, determine accounting fraud. And this involved uh, Rollins, a pest control services provider, uh, most well known for the company Orkin, uh, exterminators. And I'm not going to really go into the kind of the specifics other than there was an $8 million fine assessed against Rollins and $100,000 to the former CFO individually. But the significance here, Jay, is that the SEC is data mining companies' public information now from a data analytics perspective. And this is uh, the fourth case, Jacqueline points out, where uh, data analytics have been utilized uh, by the SEC to bring an enforcement action. And this really speaks to an entirely new level of sophistication by the SEC. If they can uh, review your public information, and without a whistleblower, without someone coming forward with the information and through a data analytics software or program or approach, then can determine that there's accounting fraud or other illegal conduct under the Securities and Exchange Act, uh, that's a very powerful tool. And yesterday I was uh, on a uh, part of a conference in the Far East, which talked about the role of data analytics for internal audit. And I pointed to him, them to this case and said, if the regulators have tools that are more sophisticated than you are, you are behind the eight ball. And you have to be far ahead of the regulators in terms of the tools, strategies, and services you're delivering. And so the, um, uh, I think this is going to be a huge wake-up call for internal audit and the uh, internal audit function in corporations that they desperately need uh, to have a data analytics capability, not simply a deep dive into three years worth of, uh, of accounting records or corporate records, Jay, but really a, a much broader data analytics. And, and this, of course, inures to the benefit of the compliance professional. As you know, in the update, the, 20, uh, the 2020 update to the evaluation of corporate compliance programs, the DOJ specified that compliance and the CCO had to have access to all siloed corporate data and uh, having internal audit with those same uh, rights or those same abilities to get into data really gives the compliance professional a great internal corporate ally to help them in a data analytics uh, function or, or component to compliance. 
many of us, myself included, are legally trained, and at least in uh, my legal education, did not include data analytics. And so uh, if you can have an ally and internal resource, Jay, for the compliance function, this can be a, a really important uh, tool for the compliance practitioner. So although this case focused on an accounting fraud and uh, the actions of Rollins, uh, and, and Jay was as, uh, uh, I don't want to say as, as straightforward as you can get, but it was simply uh, figuring out what the analysts said the company's uh, expectations were and beating it by a penny. Who does that sound like? Well, that was Enron. And that's what Jeff Skilling did every quarter. He figured out what the analysts wanted and he beat it by uh, a penny using financial engineering. Well, that's what Rollins was doing here, except here the SEC caught them with their own data. So powerful tool, powerful enforcement action, a big, strong signal by the SEC, but significant implications for no, not only internal audit, but also the compliance function, Jay. Uh, Jay, we've recently had, uh, we're a little bit past the first year of the um, SEC chair of Gary, chairmanship of Gary Gensler, and he was uh, fairly reflective in that. What did you see in the New York Times article? Yeah, this comes to us by Efrat Livni and uh, some kind of like a, a travelogue of what uh, Chairman Gensler has seen at the SEC over the last year. Uh, he was initially approved by the Senate in a 53 to 45 vote with uh, surprise, surprise, nearly all Republicans opposing his nomination. Gensler was a former Goldman Sachs executive and a veteran of both the Clinton and the Obama administration. The chairman has roused the ire of retail stock traders and crypto enthusiasts as he has raised alarms over market de developments like the gamification of trading and the proliferation of unregistered cryptocurrency tokens. He's also under fire from a variety of industries for what they say is his overreach on issues like proposed climate disclosure rules and scrutiny of shell companies and for the sheer amount of agency activity overall on his watch. As the nation's top markets regulator, Gensler was always going to be busy, but he was nominated during the unexpected trading frenzy in the so-called meme stocks like GameStop, and AMC, which was driven in part by commission-free trading apps. No one could really be prepared for a job like that, Gensler told DealBook in an interview this week. That said, he took over the SEC after 18 years in the banking industry and served at the Treasury Department. A year in, there are times that, like these that Gensler still pinches himself and thinks, wow, I've been asked to do this job. Gensler said, reflecting on what he'd been accomplished so far and explaining his regulatory agenda for the year ahead. In October, the agency published a 45-page report on the meme stock frenzy and examined how changes in tools were reshaping markets. The historic episode in 2021 was driven by retail tra traders using brokerage apps who banded together on social media to undermine big short sellers like GameStop and AMC, the movie theater chain. The report examined gamification of what Gensler calls the digital engagement, how apps can manipulate trading behavior through design features. Although the report did not propose new rules, it did suggest that they might be needed in the gamification of trading era. Companies have long reported climate-related information demanded by investors, though no, no mandatory standards currently exist. Without that standardization, Gensler said, investors have a hard time making meaningful comparisons and assessing progress. New rules proposed last month could address that gap. In March, the SEC gave initial approval to corporate disclosure rules on climate risks. Gensler points out that they are based on the input of investors, issuers, some academic experts, but not just government bureaucrats. There is nothing new about what the agency is doing, he argues, noting that risk disclosures were adopted in the 60s and that demand for environmental data began in the 70s and almost every decade since has brought additional concerns to be monitored. Markets adapt and adjust to new risk, Gensler said, and so that which is material to investors can shift. Gensler's recurring theme in this interview and the story he's sticking to is fairness through information parity in a principle that he believes applies to everything, including cryptocurrency. 
Despite the fascination with technology or perhaps because of it, Gensler does not consider cryptocurrency quite as innovative as proponents claim. And he thinks many of the old rules suffice to regulate the industry. These trading platforms are not that different from the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, Gensler said, and that millions of people are meeting and buying and selling something that is most likely a security. These, cri- these crypto tokens are crypto security tokens because entrepreneurs are raising money from the public, he added. This is what FDR and Congress addressed almost some 90 years ago, he insisted. You want to raise money from the public and the public wants to take risk. That's fine as long as you register with the SEC and you give them full and fair disclosure. Don't lie to them. Tom, what do you see when you look into the crystal ball of climate disclosures? Uh, so, Jay, this article comes to us uh, from Mai Khoi Nguyen Thon and Taylor Worth on the Corporate Compliance Insights. And it's entitled The Best Way to Navigate the Climate Disclosures Movement. And the article is really broken down into two parts. The first part I'll skip over pretty quickly because it details some of the large institutional shareholders who um, are really driving the ESG movement in their companies, their invest. In. Um, but near the end, they talk about the best practices takeaways. And Jay, these are certainly a, a great takeaways in the ESG context. But I would like to, as I did with the uh, article from Jacqueline Jager on the SEC enforcement action around Rollins, really take it as a starting point for what compliance needs to do. So let me start with the three points they first talk about for uh, companies in their environmental practices. Number one, engage in a continuous discussion with your investor base, your largest shareholders in particular. Two, given the number of interested stakeholders and the overlapping potential interest or um, uh, different types of um, uh, areas of focus from those stakeholders, balance competing stakeholder interests with your environmental goals. And then Three, management should keep the board updated on ESG matters and best practices. Now, Jay, I'd like to ask you to take those three concepts and apply them to the compliance profession. Well, a CCO, you need to talk to your largest shareholders. Uh, You need to let them know what you're doing and then broaden it out to stakeholders. If you look at what the business roundtable said on the purpose of the statement of a corporation, there were five distinct stakeholders in a company, shareholders, employees, third parties, uh, customers, and localities. Well, they are going to have competing interests. So you as a CCO need to take that into uh, account going forward. And then, of course, number three is keep the board up to date on what you are doing. We've talked a little bit in this podcast in the past about the evolving role, role of the board and its legal obligations under the Caremark standard from the state of Delaware, well, you're, you're part of your role as a CCO is to educate the board on compliance, but also teach them what they need to do as a board around compliance. So uh, I thought it was a great article. It's certainly great from the ESG perspective, but if you take those same lessons, Jay, and apply them to the compliance space, I think that uh, there's some, some pretty good value there uh, as well. Jay, um, our friend, Francine McKenna uh, started with a blog called Ray the Auditors. Uh, She took that work uh, to the Wall Street Journal and their publication, Market Watch. Uh, She went back out on her own. She's now uh, scheduled to teach in the fall at a place I think you're familiar with, the Wharton School. But she wrote a mostly most provocative article that was published in Time. And I'm not sure what the um, subscription rate or distribution rate, I suppose, of Time Magazine is now. But in my day, mm-hmm. um, it was the biggest magazine in America. And if you were in Time, you hadn't hit the big time. You were above the big time. So um, what did you see in this article that interested you or piqued your curiosity, if anything? Yeah. So uh, as Tom said, this is from Time And it's entitled, Elon Musk should have been stopped long before he came for Twitter. Is Elon Musk serious about buying Twitter? 
Given his track record for trolling and half-baked provocations, Francie McKenna doubts it. Dubious offers happen, but CEOs of public companies with multi-billion dollar market caps don't typically propose them. Musk often uses Twitter to deflect attention from serious negative reviews about him and his companies, and now he says he wants to own the social megaphone. Francine thinks Musk's tender offer to buy Twitter will fall apart because everyone, including the government regulators, should be on to his games. Twitter, as we know, recently adopted a poison pill against Musk on April 15th. The move makes it nearly impossible for him to buy enough Twitter shares on his own to gain control. Even so, Musk would have a much harder time making a pitch for Twitter if the U.S. SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, had properly sidelined him last time he attempted his antics. When the SEC settled with Musk in 2018 for casually tweeting about taking Tesla private at $420, Wink, wink. The commission ordered him to step down as Tesla chairman, but still allowed him to continue as as the CEO. Musk continued to be Tesla's largest shareholder with approximately 21.7% of Tesla's outstanding shares. Former SEC chairman Jay Clayton said Musk's penalty reaffirms an important principle embodied in our disclosure-based federal securities laws, specifically When companies and corporate insiders make statements, they must act responsibly, including endeavoring to ensure that statements are not false or misleading. Not really what Musk is known for. The SEC should have also barred Musk from serving as an officer or director of any public company, a so-called DNO bar back in 2018. Since financial penalties have minimal impact on multi-billionaires, in its original complaint, the SEC sought a full DNO bar against Musk. In the end, Musk's lawyers helped him avoid the penalty, and regulators relented, perhaps because of Musk's unusually close association with Tesla. Because the SEC and Department of Justice didn't stifle Musk's shenanigans when they had the chance, he's now been free as a bird to tweet long and loud about whatever multi-billion deal he's cooking up. Twitter investors' sentiment is on a roller coaster, up and down with each new Musk tweet or announcement over the past two weeks. Twitter stock jumped over $50 with news of Musk's initial 9.1% and then fell back down to 45.08 on April 14th, closing significantly lower below Musk's initial offer of $54.20 a share before the holiday weekend. Twitter opened slightly higher at the start of this week, but was still nearly 15% below Musk's bid. Twitter users, what Musk has referred to as a de facto town square, are arguably an important arbiter of the viability of the deal. Sentiment analysis using Google Trends, Brand24, and social search, social search on the key dates of the Twitter acquisition campaign show that the de facto town square doesn't believe Musk either. Tom, you're up, we're up for your last story. What should be on the audit committee's agenda for 2022? Jay, this uh, article comes to us from the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance by several authors from uh, Deloitte, uh, Maureen Bujuno, uh, Krista Parsons, and Kimia Clemente. And they talk about some of the things that the audit committee needs to consider. And once again, Jay, um, Uh, These would be great topics for a compliance committee uh, to consider. But for the audit committee, it's financial uh, reporting and internal controls, enterprise risk management, uh, and they have uh, entire sections on ESG and cyber risk, data privacy, and data security. Um, The digital finance transformation, uh, that's the data analytics we talked about a little bit earlier, Jay. So uh, a great, really, uh, summary of the things in audit committee, but uh, I would, uh, <clears throat> arguing to our, or, or pointing towards our compliance colleagues, ask them to consider this for the board compliance committee and take something like this to the board compliance committee, modifying it for compliance as opposed to audit and, and financial standards uh, to uh, really get them to look at various topics. Uh, certainly uh, ESG, if we'll just uh, stick on that one a little bit, 
um, not look at ESG from the financial audit perspective, but from the compliance perspective. How have you complied with your own internal ESG policies and procedures, recognizing there's no national standard in the United States yet? Or how have you looked at uh, international standards going forward? So a um, uh, great uh, piece uh, in the Harvard Law School Forum. And uh, once again, I think if compliance practitioners took a look about look at it and looked at it and thought about it from the compliance perspective, uh, it would be uh, pretty uh, instructive uh, as well. Uh, staying on an ESG kind of theme, Jay, uh, what does Lawrence Heim have for us uh, in practical ESG? Great. Uh, his uh, little article is entitled "Putting the G First in ESG." Environmental and social issues attract significant attention and resources these days, and a new memo from shareholder advisory firm Squarewell Partners suggests that it may be time to reassess priorities and put corporate governance for first, according to the report. And that's because governance should be viewed as the means of facing environmental and social risks and opportunities, not as an isolated element from this effort. One should not forget that the first recommendation of the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, requests that companies disclose their governance structure around climate-related risks and opportunities. Governance is a structural property of a company and the foundation to set a company's purpose, direction, ability to perform, and most importantly, uphold its ultimate responsibility to be accountable. Squarewell is taking a particularly strong stand, saying it will be shifting their identity away from an advisor in the ESG space, and going forward, they will work to support their clients to be governed in a way that ensures sustainability. With governance at the forefront, Squarewell urges companies and boards to do things in light of the current investment decision-making trends in order to protect against reputational and business risks and potential dissidents. Number one, consider ESG disclosure as the bare minimum to satisfy requirements of the market. And two, communicate a robust equity story that highlights the opportunities to be seized in light of key ENS megatrends, decarbonization, digitalization, et cetera, and to attract active managers that allocate capital to fund your story. For more tips on establishing governance structures to navigate the most concerning ENS issues, mark your calendar for May 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Practical ESG webcast on the topic, Putting the G First, Oversight of ENS and ESG. You can attend the webcast for free if you're a Practical ESG member, or otherwise registration information will be included on the show notes. So Tom, that's our top 10 stories for the week. Why don't you tell us about the ever-growing cornucopia of podcasts that we have for this week? So, Jay, uh, we had uh, some great pods this week. On the FCPA Compliance Report, I had part two of a two-part series with Matt Galvin, former CCO at AB InBev, and Dan Kahn, former head of the uh, FCPA unit, uh, the fraud division, uh, and the head of the fraud division assistant attorney general, or uh, for the criminal division at the Department of Justice. In uh, episode one, we talked about uh, dealing with the DOJ during an investigation and enforcement action. In part two, we really took a deep dive into the Lisa Monaco speech. And the um, um, enforcement action this week from Stericycle, I thought really borne out. Uh, I've uh, taken a deep dive into that in my blog post series on it. Uh, but they talked about the culture of the company. And then, of course, a monitor was uh, imposed uh, because, as they said in the uh, Depart- Deferred Prosecution Agreement, Stericycle had not been able to thoroughly test their compliance program after the remedi- initial remediation uh, because of the uh, culture, corrupt culture of the company. So a uh, great two-part series. Those guys know as much compliance as, as, as anybody, and they probably forgot more than most of us. Um, uh, I have the only podcast dedicated to the intersection of compliance and ESG as well. And it's appropriately called Compliance ESG Podcast. Uh, but the thing about it, Jay, is it's a limited series. It will end in May. And it's also in the video format. So if you like to um, 
take in your podcast from a video side of things, it's on YouTube and I've linked to the YouTube link in the uh, show notes. Our most recent episode was with Eric Peters, Erica Peters rather of um, Exeter. And we talked about ESG standards. So if you want something for your viewing pleasure, it's definitely uh, uh, fulfills that. This month on the Compliance Life, I've had the uh, pleasure really to visit with Susan Divers, a director of thought leadership at LRN. Uh, Susan was the CCO or CECO, I think, at AECON, a, a international, a major international construction firm. Um, uh, she had a really fascinating life, and in this episode, which hosted this week, uh, we talked about her moving to the CCO chair and utilizing a lesson she learned uh, in the uh, prior portions of her career. Uh, next week, as a little teaser, we're going to talk to her about her work at LRN and how being a CECO really informed that going forward. I have to to bring up the the MCU, Jay. Megan Doherty and I are on a, uh, I'm not even sure how long anymore, exploration <laughs> of the full MCU. Uh, right now we're on the movies. We're probably going to go back and do the series as well. But with, at least within the movies, we're doing them in chronological order, not a uh, release date. So we uh, had uh, last week the Black Widow, this week the Black Panther. Um, I don't know how many times I've seen the Black Panther. I still love it. Uh, it's uh, Chadwick Bostwick is a great actor. I'm sorry we lost him way too early, but uh, everything about the Black Panther was extraordinarily cool literally from the first time I saw it in the theater. And and The Black Widow, I was not a fan of on my first watching last summer, but I saw a lot more um, in it this time. And Megan really pointed out the sister's dynamic um, of big sister, big sister, little sister uh, in, in it this way as well. Uh, lastly, Jay, uh, I hope that our listeners will consider going to Compliance Week 2022. It's going to be the first major conference since the pandemic. Uh, shut down of March 2020. Listeners to this podcast can get a discount by using the code TFLAW for $200 off. Uh, it's going to be a fabulous uh, conference, some great keynote speakers, but most important, Jay, we're all going to be together again for the first time in over two years. So I hope uh, listeners will uh, consider uh, Compliance Week 2022. I'm certainly looking forward to it, and I know you and your AMI colleagues are as well. Uh, so with that, Jay, back over to you. Thanks, Tom. As always, Tom is the voice of compliance, and he can be reached at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. And I'm Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor. You can reach me at the initial J, R-O-S-E-N, at affiliatedmonitors.com. Both Tom and I would like to thank you for joining us for this week in FCPA, episode 298 for the week ending April 22nd, 2022, the NBA Playoffs are here edition. We appreciate you spending some of your week with us, and we look forward to seeing you next week when we take a look at this week in FCPA. Take care. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. There's a lot of information in the show notes in the audio podcast portion of this recording. So check that out on the Compliance Podcast Network, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever great podcasts are found. Thanks again, and we look forward to visiting with you again next week on This Week in FCPA.